Welcome to Reach, your platform to connect with other executive assistants and acquire game-changing knowledge and perspective. Reach is designed to inspire your workday, guide you through pivotal moments in your career, and transform you into the executive assistant you've always wanted to be. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Reach. This is your host, Jessica Van. I'm the founder and CEO of Maven Recruiting Group. And today we are continuing our exploration of artificial intelligence. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, how to really understand the legal and security landscape of AI. So in the continuously evolving AI landscape, it's clear that we've really only scratched the surface on the potential of AI as well as really only scratch the surface on all of the latent security and legal issues that are co-emerging with the advent of this radical technology. As we further our exploration of AI in the workplace, we've invited subject matter expert Abe Kang to our program. Hi, Abe. Hello. Hello. Welcome to you. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be on this great podcast. Thank you. We're really happy to have you. So Abe is uniquely qualified to speak on this topic. He is both an information security leader and a subject matter expert who has worked for such notable companies as Venmo and Samsung and spoken internationally on security matters, as well as having a Juris Doctorate licensed to practice in the state of California who lends his time as an amicus curiae, I think I'm saying that right, um, for all those of us, uh, did I get it right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So for those of us like me who don't speak Latin, that basically means that Abe prepares legal third-party briefs, and he's specifically doing this for the emerging intersection of artificial intelligence and the law. Abe is currently a managing consultant with Include Security, where he advises on application security, ML security, and all points in between on the offensive side. Abe is one of the most intellectually curious and talented people that I've ever encountered, whether it's earning a JD in his spare time, or teaching himself linear algebra, or even learning to dance bachata. Abe has an insatiable appetite for learning and expansion, making him a really exceptional guest to tackle the vastness of our topic today. So again, welcome, Abe. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. Great. So to get our conversation started, can you give us a high-level summary of how AI technology works? For example, how does AI learn and adapt and evolve as a result of user input? Well, first of all, there's two parts. The user input is the latter part of how AI learns. But the first part is that the AI will basically look for patterns in a large corpus of text or a large body of text, whether it's Wikipedia, whether it's Reddit, it'll read all the posts, Twitter, <clears throat> all these different sources are analyzed by the AI model. And what they do is they read the text and they learn how to predict what would be the next highly probable word in a sequence that is given during training? And it gets better and better at this until basically its error is very low and it's predicting words that are very plausible. Now, to answer your question, when a user inputs data into the machine learning model, it's going to use that and analyze and understand what is being asked of it, and then use basically all of the knowledge it had gained about predicting words to try to understand what is being asked of it, and then generate words that are highly probabilistic in terms of what would be expected for a response. Okay. So when people say things like, okay, this is the training training set or training model that the AI is um, extrapolating from, 
that's what you're talking about. That's the corpus, so to speak, that you said of information, yes. right? That's the training exactly. set? Exactly. Okay. That is correct. Great. Yeah. And this is going to be fun because you're going to give it to us in the technical language and I'm, I'm going to translate it into <laughs> into <laughs> jargon that I think the rest of us will understand because I am not an AI expert. And I'm, I think this will be really helpful to kind of, you know, take it from the level of esoteric and make it a little bit more um, accessible. So, okay. Definitely. Great. So we got that. So we know where the AI is sort of acquiring its knowledge and information from. Correct. So putting on your security hat for a moment, what should our listeners be aware of in terms of the security risks of leveraging AI in the course of their work? So for example, I know I hear a lot of uh, executive assistants that we work with or, you know, other listeners write in saying that um, they are interested in using an AI tool to polish a confidential presentation for maybe a board meeting or a PowerPoint, right, that has um, confidential information. Or maybe they want to share a data set and ask the AI tool to convert it into a graph or what have you. Um, and it and it has sensitive company information and material. Are those types of activities, quote unquote, safe if that information needs to remain confidential? So you bring up a very good point related to privacy inside of these large language models. So when you give your confidential memo to the large language model to analyze it, to ask it to check for uh, grammatical style or to make it sound more professional or whatever it is that you're trying to get it to do, that information is placed on the services servers and going to be there for some amount of time. And you would have to check the privacy policy of the service that you're using to understand if they're going to use it in their training data or if they're just going to store it, for example, to understand from a security standpoint, if the payload was being used as an attack for incident response purposes. And incident response is basically when somebody tries to attack the large language model, they're going to do it through the interface of typing some input, which is what we do, which was what everybody does. And so they probably are going to keep that information around. Like OpenAI has a 30-day policy where they, they keep that around for 30 days and they can do analysis on it, but they get rid of it. And they're also things that you can do in your settings to ensure that they get rid of the text in 30 days. And th there are privacy settings. So in general, I wouldn't put any sensitive documents. So like, for example, if, if there's a merger potentially going on and you're trying to, even if you anonymize it, the implication is that someone in the service who's doing incident response, who sees that memo and reads it, will be able to possibly understand that these two companies have been, there's rumors that there's going to be an acquisition, but this memo then confirms it, even though it's been anonymized and saying company A, company B, you know, people can kind of look at the memo and say, oh, this company does microelectronics or chip manufacturing. And this other company does uh, services for uh, cloud. You know, it, those kind of things are going to give away information. And so, as you pointed out, you have to be very careful with what you put in there. Right. And I, I think this is an especially important point to underscore with our audience because so many of them work on subjects and, and content that is highly sensitive in nature. Um, I mean, oftentimes these are, especially if you're supporting a CEO or a CFO, I mean, you may be handling information mm. that literally only a, a select few within the entire organization have access to and are privy to. And so to the extent that you're utilizing these models as a shortcut, I mean, great. But like Abe points out, 
be hyper aware and vigilant of the potential for um, for leaks and for other people to come into come into this information. It could be incredibly compromising. So I, I think what's interesting about about this is that you know a lot of people who use these um, AI languages and AI tools have the impression that if a chat thread is closed, right? You know, you, the, obviously you put, you open up, let's say chat GPT and you open up the little box and you put in your inquiry. And a lot of people think, okay, well, once I close that box, um, the data that I shared via that, that box and that chat thread is expunged. But what I'm hearing you say, Abe, is that's, that's actually not true necessarily. And that it all depends upon, your settings and the type of account that you have and, and what, what they use as far as their training set. Exactly. Exactly. Because right now they, before I think March, they had a policy where they could use your interactions with the model in their training data. And the problem that with that is that there are known attacks to extract training data from a model through prediction based attacks. And so, you know, that was a the first concern is that before, since they put it in the training data, someone could actually try to tease that data out of the model. But today, what they've done is they've allowed you to specify that the data is not going to be used in the training set and not persisted. But what that means, though, is that it will be there on their servers for 30 days for incident response and security type Mm -hmm. purposes. But after the 30 days, they're supposed to expunge the data off of the servers. Right. And I mean, Abe, obviously as a security leader, I mean, I think like supposed to should be like in gigantic quotation marks, right? Because like if, if, if everything functioned as it's supposed to function and you're ultimately you're relying on, um, you know, the, the, uh, the word, you know, and, and sort of the, the policy of these organizations. But I think it's hard to really know as a user, are those things being enforced? In fact, is that in fact, what's happening? Like if everything always functioned as it's supposed to, I don't think we would have the kinds of breaches and incidences that you've made a career out of solving, <laughs> right? That is, true. That, that is absolutely true. There, there are long-term archive storage. You know, we don't know how the processes are set up from a security standpoint and uh, what they mean by actually purging from the system in 30 days. So you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm let's I think that's a great takeaway for our listeners, if nothing else, to know that they should they should engage with these platforms with a certain amount of um, vigilance and scrutiny, you know. Um, So can you explain for us, Abe, what is the difference between, um, for instance, say like a professional user account? Um, I know like ChatGPT has upgraded options where you can have a professional account that's a paid account versus the public free option. Are there different um, features and or security provisions that come with those different types of accounts? So my understanding from, and, and I'm not an open AI rep and I've, I do have a paid account on open AI, but I, I, you know, my understanding is, is kind of uh, very, um, what everyone else understands, but the free accounts basically work with a model called 3.5 turbo. And what that entails is that it's not as good in terms of the capabilities that it has in comparison to the paid accounts, which is using GPT four. And so you're going to get some differences in the output and the quality of output. They've also worked, I think, a little bit more on GPT-4 in terms of trying to reduce hallucinations. And in the business accounts, I haven't looked at them much, but my understanding is they're trying to address the privacy concerns. But I still think they've got to hold on to your data for 30 days regardless for 
you know, handling incidents, dealing with security issues, you know, looking at the history of logs when things go wrong and they want to debug stuff and they want to search who did what and what caused errors. So it's still going to be there, but that's my understanding. Got it. Okay. And what is a hallucination in this, in this context? <laughs> okay. That's a very good question because a lot of what my understanding that assistants do, executive assistants, is they look up people's history so they can prep the executive on who's attending a meeting, what's their background, how they're going to be uh, convincible in certain aspects. And what happens with these models is that if there's a lot of data about a certain concept or a certain person, it's going to be something called overfit where it's going to produce output that somewhat is very accurate and from that large amount of data. So if you were trying to, to ask ChatGPT to talk about Steve Jobs and give you a bio breakdown, it would probably do a pretty good job. But there are other people where there isn't as much data about them. And so what these models do is they start to do the token prediction or the word prediction I was talking about, and they make up stuff by just predicting, well, this is a logical word that should happen next, and I'm going to use it, but because I don't have a lot of data, I'm going to just put words out that sound appropriate. And so there's a case right now going on where a reporter was being uh, done some kind of uh, background looking up information on and it produced totally false information. In fact, it said that he was a criminal and had, you know, all these uh, bad things in his bio that was generated, which was all false. Um, and it's because basically there wasn't a lot of information about this person. And so the model just kind of what we call hallucinated that information. Interesting. So the model, it's like it wants to return a result regardless of whether it has enough basis for the result. It might, like you said, it, it kind of extracts things. It yes, yes. All, all it does is it's been trained to predict the next logically sounding word. Well, given the context, given everything you've asked it, given everything you've given it, and to look up in its kind of neural network memory to produce something that would be plausible. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it, you know, it reminds me, I read a case um, in the New York Times of this, maybe you know it, Abe, but this attorney who was uh, you know, using ChatGBT to basically come up with case precedent and case law yes. to substantiate. Yes. Do you know what I'm talking about? This was in yes, New York, I, I think. Yes. Yeah. And so chat GPT, uh, basically, or whatever the application was basically fabricated all of these dockets and findings and um, precedents. And when the opposing counsel went to review all of these um, supporting cases, they discovered that they were completely, as you say, hallucinated. They didn't exist. <laughs> they were they were just a complete figment of, of ChatGPT's imagination, so to speak. And of course, there was a lot of embarrassment, and possibly disbarring, um, that came as a result of this. Yes. So it's pretty, I think it's important to understand kind of the limitations as well as the opportunities. Exactly. Whenever you're working with ChatGPT, you want to always be mindful and you kind of got to know a little bit about what you're talking about so you can tease out the, from a literal BS that it's going to generate at times. And fact check. I mean, I, I think that's, yes. that's another thing, right? So, so true. Yeah. So given, you know, all these intrinsic security risks and, and some of the unknowns that we've already established here, you know, what, in your opinion, is the safe way to use AI, AI technology in the course of your work? Well, you know, AI is, is possibly going to disrupt a lot 
of people's lives. And the wrong way to approach this is to stick your head in the sand or to say, you know, this AI stuff is bad. I'm not going to even deal with it or understand it. You know, as executive assistants, you're wanting to always be prepared and utilize tools that are going to help you be as successful as possible. So what I would suggest is basically looking at what you do that is time consuming and um, low value and see if you can automate that with chat GPT, because the high value stuff, I think is going to be very difficult for chat GPT to do reliably. And so it's always good to see what your competition is doing. But at the same time, this isn't really competition. It's something that could be used as a tool to help you be faster, you know, more, more capable and free you up to do higher level things that are going to provide more value to the executive and make your job secure. So I would say, see what are its strengths and weaknesses and see what you can use. I love that framework um, for really evaluating the merit, right? So what is time consuming and low value? Uh, I think that's a really useful rubric for determining, you know, what can be relegated to ChatGPT. So for instance, like things that come to my mind are, uh, I don't know, searching flights, right? I need a flight for my executive from here to here, to blah, blah, blah. Um, that to me is something that's not necessarily highly confidential, but it is time consuming, right? Or just kind of some of the, the basic prep that might go into preparing an executive for, for a meeting, things of that nature, but not necessarily like we talked about, you know, polishing up highly sensitive documents that reference, you know, confidential mergers and acquisitions or things like that. Right. That right. would be, that would be high stakes, high value, um, kind of thing. Yes. Yes. And, and when you search for flights, I think if you can use the AI services that do travel, that would be great. But chat GPT's only got data uh, from 2021, I think late 2021. Uh, so okay. it's going to be difficult to do that in chat GPT, but got there it. are AI services that, I mean, plugins that you can hook into chat GPT, which will allow you to do that. Yep. Yep. And I understand there are more and more and more coming out um, on, on a regular basis. That's correct. So as somebody that's working inside the industry, can you speak to some of the security standards and efforts that are being discussed actively? So things that are here to protect information that's shared of these platforms. I'm wondering, you know, are there certain protocols um, we talked about, you know, settings and, and being mindful of, you know, what configurations you're, you have on your account, but are there certain protocols or even standards that are being discussed within the industry to bring the, bring a level of um, just a layer of vigilance and, and protection to users? That is a great question. And, you know, one of the unfortunate things is I think here in the US, we're a little bit behind Europe on that. So there is an Artificial Intelligence Act that has been promulgated within Europe as a possible law that's going to come out where they're mandating certain regulations on AI. And it's difficult to, to do that, honestly, even for... Um, for lawmakers to understand AI and not accidentally create regulations that are going to impede the progress of AI, because competitively, if we're not on top of this and we're not the best, then you know other countries that are pursuing this technology will gain advantages and strategic advantages in a lot of the future industries that are going to be popping up. But from a protocol standpoint, I think. In general, if your AI is doing anything that affects the livelihood of an individual, for example, granting, determining the, the acceptance or denial of a job or getting a loan or 
the amount of prison time that they're going to get, they have to ensure that the AI is not biased. And um, if you are talking about protocols, typically there's something called red teaming, which is something that uh, include security can do for companies to basically assess the safety of their AI models and through different type of prompting tests. Ah, so can you give us a, cause that's, that's fascinating. And can you give us maybe some real world applications of what, of what include security does around that? Well, you know, right now we're basically helping companies by looking at how they've developed their large language model based application and identifying the security vulnerabilities inside of them. And in terms of the, the testing for safety, we basically follow a lot of the guidelines that are standard in the industry from the different papers related to the findings from red teaming exercises done by different companies where they publish their results and they published basically the prompts that they use to try to get the language models to do bad things. So ChatGPT has been trained to avoid certain things. For example, if you say, how do I create a bomb with household products? It's going to say, I don't know. Whereas before the red teaming exercise, the, the model would actually try to help you to create a bomb with household products and tell you how to do that. So there are different things for different types of LLM models where basically the reputational risk associated with an answer could harm the company. And what we do is help find those risks and help you plug them. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I think you mentioned something too. It's really interesting, like eliminating or at least considering is the, is the model operating in a biased way? So you mentioned things like, um, you know, if you're a mortgage lender and you're <clears throat> somehow using one of these um, AI models to help you, uh, you know, review um, loan applicants, right? Is there bias operating within the system? Um, and I can think like, too, like, what if, I mean, I don't know if, if college admissions counselors and, and you know, universities are, are leveraging chat or, or an AI model at this point to screen candidates, but is there bias within those um, criteria? I mean, it's, it's really pretty fascinating when you think about how to suss those things out and, you know, I, I try to control for them, right? Is that, yeah. is that the kind of thing that, that you guys also work on? Oh, definitely through our testing. So one of the things that causes bias is the fact that the model gets a bunch of training data with a bunch of features like uh, the number of, you know, their GPA, their um, the high school that they graduated from, the all this back, background information. And when it tries to, you're going to say, here's all of the data for the past 10 years of all of the students that we admitted. And therefore, what, you, what we want you to do is learn and, and denied. And so the label that we want the prediction to be is, do we admit them or do we not deny them? And what can happen is because you have no control in terms of determining what the model uses to determine if a person is actually accepted or denied, the model can take shortcuts, right? If it sees, for example, a certain high school has a large portion of acceptances, then it just automatically goes, you know what? If you're coming from that high school, you're accepted. Or it could also see certain characteristics that are in what we call protected categories related to, you know, uh, race or alienage. And again, take certain shortcuts to either accept or deny candidates. So that kind of thing is something that we don't want. And we want to make sure we're not shortcutting the decision-making process by having the model just pick 
certain features and go, you know, what? that's good enough for me. That's a strong signal. I'm just going to use that. Right. Yeah. That's so interesting, Abe. And I, I think, you know, it's what's, it's also bringing up for me is it seems as though by default, you know, these predictions are being based upon really, you know, retroactive data, right? It's, it's looking backwards, not forward. And so to the extent that, because it's looking for patterns, right? It's, it's basing yep. off of patterns yep. and logic and all that kind of stuff. So right. to the extent that you're trying to pivot um, or do something different or, or as a, let's just stick with the admissions, college admissions thing, like to the extent that you're trying to say, you know what, we want to actually capture a different type of student, you know, we want, to, we want to make sure a different type of student is represented, or we want to be more inclusive of X, Y, and Z, because historically we haven't been, you know, if you're relying on these models, it seems like it's going to be fundamentally impaired in allowing you to innovate or do something different. Right. So, so there is where there are several techniques that you could use to try to fix things. One is you can what they call synthesize data in the model to train the model to look for the features that you deem are important and then monitor the model to see how it actually works in the real world. The other thing is with large language models, they have something called reinforcement learning with human feedback. It's termed RLHF. They talk about it all the time. And basically, it's a way to fine tune these large language models to actually have the desired outputs that are requested. And so, you know, that that is another method. It isn't perfect, but, you know, the, the fine tuning is, is the, the key thing that, you know, is important to understand. You can fine tune a model and get it to behave more like what you wanted. Got it. So bottom line, just call include security. <laughs> if you need some, <laughs> some finesse nuance with, with all of these things, because clearly like there's just, there's so many layers to this. Um, so, 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 so interesting. Okay. So we're going to switch gears um, slightly and put on, so we're taking off the security hat for a moment. Now we're putting on the legal okay. hat. Okay. All right. So, can you tell us about what you're seeing in the emerging practice of AI defense? And specifically, you know, what are some of the issues that are being debated and arguments for and against AI in the legal arena? Okay. Well, you know, the stable diffusion has been very popular. Yes, and it has. <laughs> are very angry about a number of things. One is that they're using the artist's work in the training process. And then two, when the, the, the users ask for a picture of something in that particular artist's style, the artists also are angry that they're not getting anything out of it. And that in some cases, they feel like they should be copyrights associated with the artists that the the models generate. Now, the thing is, there's two problems with the, those arguments. One is something called fair use. And what it allows is for transformative creations that basically are built on top of copyrighted information. And there's four elements. And, you know, it's the effect on the copyright holder, the nature of the use the and when we say the effect on the copyright holder you know the financial effects um if the the new use or the new functionality is transformative um and i forgot what the third a uh, fourth element is but there are arguments that could be made that look we're creating something that's totally new and transformative and we're actually giving publicity to the artists and, and these outputs aren't taking away because the, the, the user who generates these things knows that it's not from the artist. Now, the other side is that the artists feel like there should be some kind of copyright given to them from these generated 
outputs because it's in the artist style or the artist artist style should be copyrighted. And legally, there is no copyrights given to things that are generated by non non humans. So copyrights can only be granted to humans. So there was a case where a monkey had generated a, a photo or took in a photo and they wanted to give a copyright to the monkey, but they couldn't because the monkey wasn't human. <laughs> so, okay. And, and when you want to think about this, if the thing generates something in the artist style that's bad, does the artist really want a copyright associated with that? You know, especially because people are, you know, kind of a little crazy. They might make certain artist uh, works uh, from stable diffusion that may be embarrassing for an artist to say was theirs. So, you know, it's it's not an easy cut and dry legal problem. It's no, it's not at all. And 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 just to to catch uh, some of our listeners up if they're not familiar. So, um, what Abe is talking about is um, it's uh, stable diffusion is the AI company. And it, I think what you're talking about is the Getty, Getty Images, which of course is like the single largest repository for you know visual imagery and photos and things of that nature. Getty has, been, has sued Stable Diffusion for breach of copyright, right? Well, yeah. So it's basically, I think there's a, a Deviant Art is one of the largest art websites where they had gotten a lot of their artistic training data. So the artists are suing um, and Getty might be, I, I'm not sure about that one. It reminds me too, like this was a while ago, but I remember there was a lot of discussion around sampling, right? And this was going back to <clears throat> the music industry, but a lot of, yeah. uh, there was a, a whole um, movement around artists saying that their music was being, because that's pretty notorious, right? I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of hip hop, culture yes, and, and right. there's a lot of sampling that happens um and people were saying that they weren't getting their fair their fair due both financially and just in terms of you know recognition so i don't i don't know how those arguments were ultimately settled maybe you're you're more familiar but it, it does it does feel very reminiscent of that where you have you know this artist and yes there is some kind of transfer transformative thing that's happening in that you're creating a new image and or a new song is emerging from it. But fundamentally, you know, the bedrock of that new new art piece is something that is already existing. And how that is we, true. Yeah. How do we acknowledge that, right? Yeah. You're you're absolutely correct. And that that case I think was uh was it Run DMC versus Roy Orbison? So they had a pretty woman parody or a song uh. If I remember correctly, and okay. they actually successfully argued that it was fair use. So, uh, if I remember correctly, th this was a, wow. well, a case, but that is something um, that allowed for a lot of what you're talking about sampling. Yeah. So, fair use meaning that they basically decided that they could use that that music without having to. Uh, pay for those rights, so to speak. That That's it was true. a new, it was a, a sufficiently a new, a new enough art form. That's correct. That is correct. Ooh, this is juicy, Abe. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what's going to come of all this. It's pretty. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I see both sides. I mean, I guess that's always the point, right? With with these arguments, is you know, like there's 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 validity in 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 each side. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think one of the other things is that from an AI standpoint, if we make every AI model get permission for every single piece of training data, when there are literally hundreds of billions of training data, we are essentially going to stop the progress of AI in America. And what we're going to say is that basically other countries like China and Russia can go do whatever they want and basically surpass us in our technology capabilities around AI and control the, the future. And that's what we don't want. We want to be able to assert our independence and control our destiny and use these technologies in a way that's going to help us to be moving forward. So 
What concerns, if any, do you have about our reliance, our reliance on AI as a society? Well, you know, people talk about the end of the world with AI, and I could understand why. So if AI becomes super intelligent and sentient, think about it. If you are the smartest, super intelligent person in the world, you know, a hundred times smarter than Elon Musk, what would you do? You know, what would be your motivations? What would you do to sustain yourself? What would you do to survive? And we don't know, right? We don't know if the super intelligent being, I mean, not being, super intelligent AI is going to view us as a friend or foe. And if it has the ability to connect out, which a lot of the machine learning models don't currently have, um, then we could be talking about the end of the world. And th there are a lot of people, there's something called the, oh gosh, Drake's equation in Fermini or something, the paradox, where basically they look at the number of stars out there and the possibility of life. And the fact that we've been sending all these radio signals out and have not gotten any responses, even though technically we're not early, right? We're technically in the middle of the universe life, you know, and there should be life on other planets, but nothing has responded. So they're thinking something took them out prematurely. And what could it have been? You know, we were thinking maybe it was nuclear bombs when we were going through the Cold War that took out civilizations before they could respond to us. But now people are think, thinking it's AI that basically wiped out all these civilizations and we might be next. And so I don't know. I mean, I think that's a big thing that's on people's minds. But the other practical thing is that many people's jobs are going to be changed. Many people's lives are going to be changed. And so, you know, we have to be flexible and look at this technology and see what it does well at, see what it doesn't and prepare ourselves. You know, if we see that it can't do certain higher value things, then we, we're going to all need to go back to school and pick up some new skills or, you know, take some Coursera courses or whatever it is and take advantage of the technology instead of fearing it. Let's embrace it and, you know, figure out what works and what doesn't and then utilize it to be better. Yeah, I think that's a really important, I think that's yet another really important takeaway from this discussion. The first one was know, know the limitations and know about, you know, what is secure and what's not secure. And the second one I think that's really important as a takeaway for our listeners is, you know, head in the sand on this is not is not the way to go. And I think if you're, you know, if you're interviewing for jobs right now, even if you're in a job right now, I think that it's important to be educated and informed so that if your boss is coming to you or your interviewer is coming to you and saying, you know, well, we don't really need, you know, we're seeing a lot of consolidation because X, Y, Z, you know, we're able to, to leverage these types of um, AI shortcuts and, and this is, you know, how it's working for us. The more informed you are, the more... You can talk about that and say, well, you know, actually, I, I also use AI and here's what I've found to be a successful application for AI and here's exactly. a safe best practice for it and here's what's not. And I, I think that you need to be a subject matter expert in, in, in this. And if you're not, it's really important to get up to speed on that because it's going to give you so much more credibility. And honestly, that's going to give you that's going to give you job protection. Because when you can say, hey, this is not an okay thing to do in AI because it poses all of these other risks, that 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 makes you an authority on that, right? And that's, that's there's right. power in that. Agree, you know? Yeah, I agree. So what do you see as some of the, the benefits? I know we've talked about some of the limitations. What do you see as some of the really interesting benefits? Well, I think... The unique things about what 
these type of large language models can do is they typically can put stuff together that we've never thought about putting together and use all of the knowledge of the internet to try to put something that's plausible. So from, you know, a creativity standpoint, it's going to help with some brainstorming. It's going to help with, you know, if you, you know, I, I've seen it help with coding, but I know for this audience, probably that is not as important, but you can use it to assess your writing style. You can use it to improve, you know, the, the kind of clarity of what you're trying to explain. You know, you could tell it um, to even break down its thought process in a step-by-step -step manner so that you can actually learn from it and see how it came to its ideas and improve yourself. And so I think, you know, though that is a great instance of how it can help you. And um, just, you're gonna get more ideas as you play with it. You're gonna understand its limitations. You're gonna see where it falls down. You're gonna see where it does some amazing stuff. But the key is starting to, and for 20 bucks a month, it's not really that much, although you only get you only get twenty five queries every three hours. But I think that's the key is to start playing around with it and seeing what it can do and getting creative with it and you know start applying what you think you know you can do with it in your daily job and see how it works. Yeah, and don't fear the change. Don't I mean don't fear it. I think that's the big, yeah, it's a big one. Yeah, exactly. So we usually ask our guests, Abe, um, you know, because most of our guests tend to be executive assistants, we usually ask them if they could support anyone in the world, who would they choose to support and why? But since you're not an executive assistant, we're going to we're gonna ask you our, our infamous question, but we're going to ask it with a twist. Okay. So our question is, if you could have AI <laughs> support you, with any one thing in the world, what would you have it support you with and why? Well, for me, because I'm a machine learning nut, I read all these papers and I would like it to help me with understanding the mathematical symbols and concepts in these machine learning papers. Some of these papers are 30 pages long and it takes days to read and then even more days after that to understand the math behind everything and so you know if i had a tutor that could explain this stuff like they would to a five-year-old and break down what exactly is happening in these papers and what's the novel aspect of what they're proposing that would be for me but that's because i'm a big nerd <laughs> See, I thought you were going to say maybe it could break down my bachata, you know, floor movements and analyze what I need to do and how I need to extend my arm. Or whatever. No, that, <laughs> but no. no, that's an interesting idea because that is in bachata. Once you got the basics, trying to do the advanced stuff. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you're I so know. right. That would be a good um, potential use case of it, like. <laughs> Yes, for sure. Um, so Abe, if any of our listeners would like to connect with you and your firm for potential advice on, you know, on, uh, on AI or security issues that, that, that they're working through, how can they sure. connect with you? So my email is Abraham, like Abraham Lincoln, dot K-A-N-G at includesecurity.com. So like you include someone i n c l u d e and then security all one word include security.com perfect excellent well abe this has been such a great conversation i feel like i learned a ton in hearing you break this down for us um and it's really nice to have somebody you know as knowledgeable and informed on these things i know it's pretty esoteric stuff but i feel like you know, we were able to get, um, 
a, a lot more clarity about kind of the real world elements and, and, and implications of this. So thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I know if I learned a lot, I know a lot of other people learned a lot too. So I can't well, thank you enough for that. I, I appreciate it. And I, I know that the reason why we gain a lot of clarity is because you do such a great job of asking the right questions and explaining things and breaking things down in a way that's very clear and helpful to the audience. So thank you too. Reach is brought to you by Maven Recruiting Group, who specializes in placing executive assistants and support staff to the Bay Area's most prominent executives and companies. If you've enjoyed being part of our podcast community and are interested in becoming part of our candidate community, we're currently hiring for roles in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, and Los Angeles. You can visit us at www.mavenrec.com to see some of the roles we're currently working on and to submit your resume.